If you take the time to build a bench like this, like Kenny did, it's going to last 150 years, or maybe a lot longer as long as the shop doesn't burn down. So we've been together in this shop before. A couple of years ago, I made a video about the friend that revolutionized my thinking. In this shop and in the house that this friend built out of this shop. And this is the place that my thinking began to be altered about allowable tolerances and perfect as an allowable tolerance. And this bench was one of the big contributors to that paradigm shift for me. You might remember that when I was in here a couple of years ago, I made the observation that I've long appreciated shaker style workbenches like this, but I didn't think I could build one. Well, guess what? I'm fresh out of excuses. I've got Kenny. He can tell me how, he can show me how. I have the fine woodworking article that he used to um, develop the bones and build this de this bench 30 years ago, you said? 30 years ago you built it? Almost, yeah. Almost 30 years ago. I've got the wood and I've just upgraded my shop. So now I've got the space and the tools and everything except the actual experience of making something like this for myself and perhaps more importantly for my kids and my grandkids. So right now I want to point out to you in case you can't see it why I love this so much. Some of the details that I need to get my head wrapped around because doggone it, it's time for me to do this. Now I want you to stay tuned because once we've looked this bench over and kind of gotten our hands on some of the details, I'm going to take you back to my workshop which has just been upgraded enough that it gives me the confidence that I need to at least start a project like this. So hang with us because you're going to get to see where it's going to happen. Kenny's design I think is superior to the one in this October 90, 1993 Fine Woodworking magazine. Ken says that this is the second Fine Woodworking magazine that had in-depth articles on shaker style workbenches. He didn't have the first one still, but he has a second for me to look at. And I'm not going to copy this guy's bench because I'm copying Kenny's. I'm going to dedicate one space for cabinets and much more for drawers, just like Ken did. And it's going to be much more faithful to the shaker aesthetic and appearance. But I am going to use these details about sort of a making bents and mortising and tenoning the framework together and then hanging the drawers off of the rails inside each of those individual cavities. Now here's a book match, sort of a, uh, um, not exactly vertical grain, but look at the beauty of that. Can you see the fleck, the medial rays, medullary rays in the cellular structure of the white oak makes this fleck characteristic. We're going to have quite a lot of that. In ours, I think that I'm going to probably forge some knobs since we're working in a blacksmith space also. A couple of things that I'm not going to attempt, I don't think I'm going to need to, I'm not going to make this rest because I don't have a bandsaw yet. And uh, I think that this is effort that I'm not going to expend. I had about decided that I was going to use box joints instead of dovetail joints on these corners, but when I look at the beauty of that, I can feel how silly it would be not to go all the way. Kenny might not say anything, but I think he probably would not approve of cutting that corner. Another change I'm going to make, Ken tells me that I will be happy if I have two of these vices, so I'm going to start shopping for a couple of these. Probably will buy new, might look for um, Old, I don't know. We'll see about that. I'm going to put it on a, he's got a two and three eighths inch thick top. I think I might have material that'll get me two and three quarters. I mean, heavier is better on the top, I'm sure. He's got just this really cool detail on the ends. Can you see that massive dovetail right there? Holding this stiffener on the back end to keep any individual boards that are in this top from flexing or moving out of flat. I'm going to do that very same thing. He's got so many good ideas here for me just to copy. And imitation, as you know, is the sincerest form of flattery. Let's pull out one of these drawers and I'll show you what is maybe, it was for me one of the most startling things to recognize, and that is that these drawers operate as smooth as glass and there's not a bit of drawer hardware in here. 
It's just the smoothness of well sanded, waxed white oak on white oak with a nice tight fit. Watch this. And these drawers are deep. And this one's heavy. Lift with your legs, boys. Lift with your legs. See that? No hardware of any kind. Just a perfectly tight drawer, dovetailed on the front, dovetail spline on the back, bearing on the bottom, relief on the top, bearing back here, nicely tapered on th three sides. So in order for a drawer to operate that smoothly, the fit has to be tight, but you still have to minimize the bearing. I mean, you've got to reduce the friction. So the friction is all on the front edge on the bottom as you start to pull it out. But then as you come past center and the drawer wants to over center, you've got to be taking care of friction back here on the bottom side of the guide that's just above it, or it's not a guide, on the bottom side of the frame that's just above it. So you can come clear out to the end, and even with that long leverage on a drawer that's got to weigh, oh, 100 pounds, it still operates nicely. So that's gonna take some care and some accuracy and some sanding and some, some finish. What finish did you put on these to get this kind of smoothness and long lasting sort of durability? Cause they look good. I mean, they live their life in the shade, but even up here where it's getting friction, it looks good. What, what'd you put on here? Duracell. Oh, that's the same stuff that your floor guy put on the floor in your house. Yes. All right. It's tough and it goes on nice. And very, it works very good. good. Yeah. The three coats, three coats. That's right. You loaned me some of that for the railing in my, in the spec house. Yes. Yeah. So Kenny, I look in here and a question comes to mind. What? How many chisels does one man need? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> They're beautiful. So if you if you just had to have four chisels out here, which would they be? Pick the four that you would take. These, these right here. Japanese. So these are a Japanese chisel. You don't hardly even use these, the rest of these now. These are the ones. Well, once in a while you use those because if you want to rubber beat, work, yeah. really hit it. Yeah. So even on the back, the frame back here, this is mortised. There's a tenon sticking out of this little, I'm going to call that a style. It's, it's just a it's just covering the joint and it's doweled. And down at the bottom, it's the same thing except two dowels. It's a longer tenon and a deeper mortise. In fact, is that a through mortise right there, Ken? No, the, that's uh, that's just a little block. It's just a block, yeah. But look at that. It, it got shown underneath the... Okay. So those look like three-eighths dowels. Oh, this no. is the quirk. There, there is a block there. There is a block, There's yeah. a block there and a block there. Yeah, yeah, matching. In in line with the frame. With the frames on the in the carcass. Yeah. So on this Shaker workbench, and there were benches a lot like this in the, I mean, for hundreds of years. But now we have to decide where to put our power. And I see a very pragmatic concession to reality here, Ken, just attaching a piece of plywood on there. And that's good. Where should, so the question is, where should I put my power? You'll see at the shop, I've got power coming from overhead, but help me think about where the power should go located in the bench itself. So the practical benefit of building something like this, separate from the emotional fulfillment that's gonna come if I can actually pull this off, is that something like this will last indefinitely if you can keep water off of it so it doesn't rot. And if you can keep from burning your shop down with your forge just behind, you know, I've got a blacksmith shop and a woodworking shop. If you can keep fire or ice water from destroying something like this, there's no reason in real terms for it not, not to last lifetimes, lifetimes. And it will only become more appealing and more useful and frankly, more um, profoundly worthwhile the older it gets. Maybe it can be like that for us, but uh, I hope it's going to be like that for my bench. So you built this 30 years ago. Yeah. You were in your early 40s. Yeah. Okay. And since then you've built furniture and you've built boxes and you built what is, in my opinion, 
the most wonderful representation of green and green architecture in this part of the country, maybe this part of the world, on this bench. You don't get a patina like this just from rubbing your hands on it. What would you do differently? If you're going to build another one, would you change anything about this? No. No. It, it... How often does that happen, ladies and gentlemen, that you get it right the first time? All right, well, I'm not going to change much. Be all right to make mine just a little longer? Yes. Do it. I had to get because I I was limited in, in, in your space. In space. Okay. Right. Now, we talked one time about more of an overhang on the end. Is this about right? Well, that's, a, that's right. This, yeah. this is um, four inches. Four yeah. inches. What's this one? Four inches. Yeah. 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 Um, and you use that lots of times to put a clamp, a clamp on it. feet to the fire on this now you make sure we do it just like this all right or maybe a little better yeah, right. yeah first of all i want to talk about the wood itself it's white oak white oak grows around here and if you can find the right trees you can get the right boards so four years ago i started looking for the right trees and it took some looking because i wanted to saw out the lumber that i was going to need for the projects that i want to accomplish while i still can I found the six trees. Actually, my friend Sai found them for me. About 25 miles north of here, near the little town of, believe it or not, Oakland, Oregon. And we have videos on our channel of the whole logging and sawing and drying and planing process if you're interested in how trees are turned into beautiful boards for projects like this. Now, I've mentioned this before. In fact, we've done several videos about this old shop. But as far as I know, this old barn, actually, was built in the 1950s, perhaps a little earlier, as shelter for livestock, cattle, mostly, judging by the milking stanchions that I tore out and the processed grass and water residue that pretty well filled this thing up when my dad bought it, oh, I don't know, probably about 1983 or so. Dad used the center section to work on his trucks. He hauled peeler core for a long time. And for the last 10 years of that, he used this old building to get in out of the weather so he could change the oil and run the racks and do the other things that a truck driver has to do sometimes. And then when Kelly and I moved back to Oregon in 1994, Dad and I used that same center bay, and I expanded a little bit to work on our logging equipment, brought in welders and cutting torches, and did some fabrication and repair on the D6, the D4, the log loader, that sort of thing. Gradually, I converted it into space that I could use as a general contractor. And then, in 2005, added blacksmithing until slowly, incrementally, $50 at a time, it's finally become a shop. And boy, am I grateful to have it. Now, the expansions and, you know, renovations and modifications and grading and clean out and tool additions and compressed air and everything that's happened in here over the years are kind of getting sort of wrapped up. I mean, most of the big ticket items have been taken care of, except to turn this back woodworking area into an actual woodworking area. And that's what we're doing now. And the main event in all of this 
is the electrical capacity back here. It took an expansion. We ran a sub-panel fed by a 100 amp breaker from the main service back to where we could run Brent's circuits off to where the individual tools are going to be working. Secret Weapon Dave was the spear tip on adding four 240 volt circuits and at this point just four 120 volt circuits plus some lighting. What a huge improvement, especially the lighting. And I just could not have done it without him. So I'm sheeting this wall and fastening it with what is essentially cabinet screws, okay? It's a, it's a cabinet screw, two, two inches long, and just a few fasteners, really, one at, around the edges and almost nothing in the field, because I want to be able to take this material down and put it back over time as my wiring changes, because I just know that I'm going to want to reposition outlets. Dave did great over the last couple days, throwing in switches and lights and some repurposed fixtures that I got from actually a friend of mine, Brady Winder. And so with the lighting better and some insulation in here, a little heat eventually with that repurposed natural gas, old school forced air heater that I've been hanging on to for probably 15 years, finally gonna get a chance to use it. But this is just to keep the insulation in place and the dust a place to you know, hit and fall down and just civilize this space a little bit but it is almost a demountable partition for those of you that do tenant improvements. It's intended to be put up and taken down and put up and taken down as the situation changes. Not bad. This little crane arrangement is repurposing one half of an antique wagon tire and one of the corbel models from the spec house. And I guess I better mention about 30 feet of an old extension cord that I'd been keeping for some unknown purpose and that unknown purpose showed up today. The ends of these cords are going to be hanging right over the top of the workbench. I'll be able to move them back and forth as needed, and I really hope that Kelly can reach them. You know, as I've gotten older, and especially as I've been making these videos, one thing has been standing out and has been on my mind, and it's this, that regardless of how old we are or where we find ourselves in life. Our jobs, really anything that we put our hands to, become a permanent part of the record that we leave. Every job, every project comes with its own levels of urgency and anxiety or zen and satisfaction or frustration or profit or loss. Some turn out to be triumphs, and some are unmitigated disasters. But they all become an indelible part of the fabric of our journey. So let's undertake more of what we undertake with both eyes wide open. Because for every one of us, the clock is running. And we may well only get this one last chance. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work.